Hey yo, it's your boy Tim Buick, and I would put mango sour in my immigrant jam. Oh my God, oh my goodness, welcome back to Immigrant Jam, the podcast. I'm your host, Lucy Paul. We are here at Gotham Podcast Studios, baby, for a very, very, very special episode featuring the one and only a rapper, man about town, personality, Queens born and raised, baby, the amazing Mr. Ten Buick is in the house. Yeah. That might hello, be the best hello. intro I've ever received. <laughs> That's what we strive for. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to get to the mango sour because I want to know what that's all about. But real quick, for those two listeners who don't know who you are out there in the world, <laughs> um, Ten Buick, you were born and raised in Queens. Your parents are from the country of Guyana. You got it. Am I right? You're correct. That's what. That's the 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 um. That's the flag. I'm out here flag representing. Yeah, that you're representing, and uh, you now live in LA. You just got married. I did. Uh, you are a rapper, but you also are like a host, right? And you you interview people, and you run around, and you're. you're... I I do I do that just for the content. So I'm a rapper and an actor, really. Um, but I would say in in the last uh, few years, I've. I also added just digital content creator to that resume. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like these are the days where you just make your own stuff. Yeah. Are we allowed to swear? Yeah, please. Okay, we're, you must. Because right, I was going to say make your own <laughs> shit, but I stopped. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I j you know, especially with the advent of like TikTok, and I just got way more inspired to do that. So I definitely will interview people as it uh, if it's like a cool thing to do for content. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, I'm, I'm a rapper and an actor. Because I saw you running around San, uh, San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, San Diego Comic Con was an amazing experience this year. <laughs> I feel like it was the first full one since um, pandemic, you know? Right, yeah. yeah, for sure. So you were born and raised in Queens. Your parents are from Guyana. They're both, they are both immigrants from Guyana? Yes, they are. When did they come here? So uh, I think they both got here. My dad maybe got here in 75 and my mom, uh, just, no, sorry, in 85. My dad got here in 85 and my mom just a cup, maybe a year or two after that. Uh huh. Yeah. I was reading about Guyana in the um, days leading up to this, and wow, it is mind blowing. The first of all, the history the, like, is crazy. The history is crazy. Then also, I read that right now because there was crude oil was found in 2019. It's on track to become one of the richest countries in the world. Yeah, yeah. So if they if they handle that situation properly, it's right. Yeah, yeah. And then above everything else, though, the biodiversity. I read you have some of the rarest orchids in the world. You have like wild these animals there's um the world's largest scaled freshwater fish yeah 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 the giant ant eater the largest ant eater in the yeah. world that's so so, so crazy. don't don't quote me on this but um i remember hearing this in a bbc documentary i watched about Guyana a couple years ago where they went into the rain because most of that country is actually rainforest right. like the part where people live is very small um, they say that it's it's w one of the last untouched, like unruined by human beings rainforest that exists in the world. Um, yeah, I read that. I read that some of the rainforest is inaccessible to humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless thank you're God. crazy. Um, yeah, thank God. Uh, yeah, in that Unless in you're that Gary Busey, right? right, yeah. right now. <laughs> oh, why? why did I think of Gary Busey in the Guyanese rainforest? I'm always thinking about Gary Busey in the Guyanese rainforest. <laughs> That's a show in itself. Um, yeah, in that documentary, while they were exploring, during that time, they discovered a new species of rodent that had never been what? discovered. Before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not even doesn't even exist in New York. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hard to believe. Right? Wow, rats! You really, you really, you're falling off. We're disappointed <laughs> Step in you. Step it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but for those listeners, because I have to confess, you know, I grew up in New York and I went to an international school, so. I don't know if you have this feeling too. Growing up in New York, you're like, I know a little bit about every country on earth. But oh, yeah. Not, you know, not entirely true. I didn't know much about Guyana. Reading about it was fascinating. But for those people listening that don't know anything about it, um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, like growing up with the culture and what it's like? And, sure. you know, like what your, what your perspective on the country and the people and the culture is? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, first of all, um, where in New York did you grow up? I grew up in the city, in downtown, and Soho. Okay, so okay, yeah. that's that, that's why. Um, yeah. If more in the boroughs, especially Queens, uh, Bronx, Brooklyn, is where you're going to find that um, that diaspora. Um, so, 
And interestingly enough, like, so I, just like you, I have that, like, I'm from New York, so I know about every culture. But Queens is factually the most ethnically diverse, like, uh, metropolitan area in the whole world. In the world, yeah. So you most get a, languages spoken in one, yeah. like, neighbor, uh, borough. Which is, which is why I'm so, you know, proud to be from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, and interestingly enough, Queens has the highest Guyanese population outside of Guyana. Wow. So growing up there, I really grew up like very entrenched in the culture, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all my, so it, it seems to me that like whoever the first set of Guyanese immigrants were, they landed in JFK and they just stayed right there. You know what I mean? They were just <laughs> like, it. all right, this neighborhood's cool. We're going to chill right here. And so everybody followed suit. And so, I mean, I was born in 89 and by the time I was coming up, I would say for a few blocks around i mean my mom's side they were all in jamaica yeah um jamaica queens that is don't want right, to confuse right, yeah right. <laughs> that's an, when you're outside in new york you always have to clarify yeah uh and and my dad's side were very much like queens village mm -hmm. but in both of those areas for like a few square blocks almost every block had like five or six people that were related to me mm. you know what i mean wow so yeah like the family was just all there um eventually when i was about 10 or 11 that's when people started the trend of or Guyanese people started the trend of moving to Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of my relatives actually got went down there. It's a lot more similar uh, to what they are used to, like weather-wise right. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, They were yeah. like, damn, the winter's fucking harsh here. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much, yeah. But but um, uh, Queens is still very much Little Guyana. In fact, they just got the sign there last year, I believe. Um, Where, on, in on, Jamaica? On Liberty Avenue. Okay, So wow. Liberty Avenue in Richmond Hill, that's like Guyana Central. Like, if mm -hmm. you were to want to get Guyanese food or um just experience Guyanese What's culture. What's Guyanese food like? It's it's a Caribbean closer to Caribbean like what we think yeah. of as Caribbean so food, it's, right? So it's it's very interesting because of the very ethnically diverse background of Guyana, right? It's very much a mix. Like your mm. typical Guyanese cuisine is a mix of all those cultures mm -hmm. because you had um you had so many people come there from Africa, from right. India, you had the indigenous population there. Um and so like for example there's a lot like there's a lot of curry present, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not exactly the same as you would find in India right. because when they when when Indians were brought to Guyana, they didn't necessarily have access to the same stuff mm -hmm. that they had in India. Mm -hmm. So it had to be modified. Mm -hmm. And it was also modified based on interacting with other folks and um, getting the way that they do things. Right. So um, there's like describing Guyanese food is really hard. Like I would, I'm probably not the best person to do it. Um, I mean, I love <laughs> it all. You're the ambassador of Guyana. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? What are you saying, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, like for example, if you were to go to, um, I'm gonna shout out Kai Chor is like my one of my favorite restaurants, Kai okay. Chor, um, or Tropical Isle. Like you could get. Um, so many different like you can get if you went there like the tropical isle for example right you would get like duck curry lamb curry etc it wouldn't be the same as you would get in an indian restaurant right like the spices are very different yeah, yeah, yeah. um and guyanese people if you went to kai Chor, you definitely would want to order like lao min or fried rice but it wouldn't be like you would get at a regular chinese restaurant right um it's because guyanese actually had a, a guyana also had a, a a fair amount of chinese um, yeah i read about that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's and, so interesting yeah so it's it's sort of evolved into like west indian uh lao mein and, mm -hmm. and fried rice um so yeah it's uh it's and is mango sour a guyanese thing yes so, so what is it so mango sour uh, hopefully i don't butcher it but it's it's a sauce that gets made so like just now when i got married like uh my mom and grandma they all they all made it because you eat it with a, like a popular Guyanese snack, which is like my favorite thing. It's called bara. Okay. It's I think it's like split peas. Mm. Uh, just it's similar to an Indian pakora, if you know what that is. Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's fried, and then mango sour is like it's almost like the chutney that you would eat with it then. Uh huh. Um, but it is it is just fucking incredible. So like, it's sweet and sour then. Yes. Because mango is sweet, and then it has sour in it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm. It, it, it the flavor palette is is insane. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it just dances across your tongue. It's 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 the gem, yeah, the immigrant gem. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So um, yeah, I I I don't know off because I'm terrible at cooking Guyanese food, um, but like once it's made, I'm I'm all about it. Mm. So growing up in Queens in um, in Little Guyana, what what's like your memory? What what do you connect with Guyana the most? Like when you think back of growing up, like what's the most Guyanese thing for you that you guys would do, or 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 I don't know, you know, that would kind of like um, symbolize 
Guyanese culture for you? Is it the food? That's a great question. The food's definitely a part of it. The food, the music. Mm. Um, so I guess when I think about growing up in Queens, the first memories that really jump to mind are that like my uh, all the extended family at the time was just so close knit. Mm. So almost every weekend, like you'd be kicking it at somebody's house, like uh -huh. everybody cookout style, you know, everybody's sort of in the backyard. Um, people are cooking, everyone's eating and playing loud music. Everybody's drinking. I'm the only Guyanese that doesn't drink, prob probably. <laughs> um, it's like part of the culture. Um, and so... What is it, rum? Yeah, rum is huge for mm -hmm. Guyanese folks. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and so... So it's the community? It's the community. Mm -hmm. The community, yeah. It's definitely a, a close-knit community. They love getting together and just like having a good time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Guyanese people are obsessed with Bollywood music. So we just would play, they, like, that's growing up, that's like the vibe. Like, you're chilling in the backyard, blasting Bollywood music to top volume, um, <laughs> you know. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. And, e and everyone's welcome, too. It was, it's kind of like, oh, if your neighbors are, like, it's like, th they wouldn't be bothered by the noise. Like, they're welcome to come hang out with you and eat with you. Everybody's, mm -hmm. like, pretty open that way. Um, so, yeah, I would say that, that's, like, my, you know, one of, one of the happiest memories that comes, comes to mind. Because there was so much of that happening. Mm -hmm. It was really almost like an every weekend occasion. And, um... The language is it's a it's a type of Creole, right? Yes, it's it's Creole English. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very interesting Creole English because it's it really is unique in that. So obviously, like all around the Caribbean, there's Creole English, right? But each Caribbean country has their own version of it. Yep. And I'd say it's mutually intelligible to those people. So, for example, like someone from Trinidad wouldn't speak the same way as someone from Guyana. Right. But we can understand each other, right. and we probably know each other's different slang. Um, or same thing with Jamaica, right? Uh -huh. But in Guyana, because of the the, the ethnic backgrounds um, of, of the population that came there, you have words that got sprinkled in from all languages, right? Uh -huh. So you have words from, it's Creole language, you have words from Hindi or, or Bhojpuri, which is a, you know, uh, um, another language in India. Mm -hmm. um, m most uh, Guyanese folks that were brought from India, um, the, it, the lineage traces back to like uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar uh, in the north and a little bit of uh, Madras in the south. Okay. Um, so that the languages come from, from there. And then you have African languages, mm -hmm. um, indigenous languages that right. were spoken there. Uh, so those, those, th there's words that were taken from them and corrupted um, mm -hmm. you know, and passed down. And so it's just part of Guyanese vernacular, um, which is kind of cool to see. You know, th there's, there, there, there's not really a way that like a typical Guyanese person looks because mm -hmm. it's so diverse there, but everybody understands everybody else, you know? That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Did you feel um, like an immigrant? Or like, did you feel that? I think it's, you know, it's always interesting because people have such different experiences. In New York, a lot of people don't feel that because I always joke, like in New York, if you're from Ohio, we tell you to go back to where you came from. Right, you know right, 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 like, yeah. If you're not from a different country, there's something wrong with you here. Yeah, you know? facts. Like, we think you're weird. But, but at the same time, you know, people do have... Uh, you know, I just talked to um, Anjali Bamani, yeah. who's one of the voices on Overwatch, um, with me, and she grew up in in Orange County, and she said she didn't have, uh, she didn't feel like an outsider at all, and yep. you know that really surprised me because usually outside of New York, how how did you grow up with that like sensibility, or were you always like proud of it? Was there ever ever a moment where you were embarrassed of your parents' accents or being different, or you know that cross cultural thing? That's that a great ever... great question. Before I answer, I just want to say because you mentioned the Anjali Bimani episode, which I yeah. listened to. Oh, um, well, I'm thanks. with the caliber. <laughs> guests that you have on this podcast i was just so incredibly honored that you would ask me to be on it stop so thank you <laughs> thank you um so happy my, to have you my homie joanna houseman was on here that mm -hmm. was that was such a dope episode um but yeah so to answer your question i would say so i'll, I'll start with a random tidbit when i when i watch old video like my mom did me the service of videoing so many moments from my childhood so i have a lot of memories wow, your mom's the og tiktoker og yeah yeah for <laughs> real for real um, and I use a lot of her footage on TikTok. Really? Yeah, because she, so she has cool. such dope VHS footage when I was a kid and like just doing dumb shit, you know? <laughs> um, but so when I look at those videos, I realized that before I started school, I legit, I just had a fucking Guyanese accent. Like I was mm -hmm. talking like I was out of Guyana. Um, and it was because that's what I was around, right? Course, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're, and then your parents and everyone, they were fresher and your grandparents were, of course, were fresher. So they're not really like losing it. Yeah. And so it's where you're around. Um, and then I guess... I probably lost it when I started school and you're just around like New York. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I, I would say that for, for a while, I never really felt 
I, I never really felt like different in terms of, I mean, I knew everybody else was not Guyanese or different, or th th so I was different in that sense, but I never really felt like ostracized per se. Mm -hmm. I certainly was never embarrassed of my parents. I was always very proud of um, my like heritage mm -hmm. um, and like pretty happy to share, especially when people were interested. Right. Um, which, which was cool. Um, th I would say as I got older, there was, so like eventually, this is an interesting story. So I, I went to, um, when I was growing up, I went to elementary school at a private school, mm -hmm. um, which my mom, uh, she she was scared that I was gonna, you know, get into trouble, and so right. that's, so she wanted me to do that. And then eventually, later on, the plan was to move to Long Island, but mm -hmm. my mom wanted me to go to school in Long Island and like start that right because she wanted me to be in a good school district and all that, like you know. So she was right. yeah. So when I started school in Long Island, I was still living in Queens, oh, and so wow. yeah. So I was every day. My mom would drop me to school in Long Island and drive back to Queens and then come and pick me up. I was the only kid that was doing that. And I've actually never heard of anybody else. That's that, wild. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but j when I started school in Long Island, I would say that's when I felt it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, it's less diverse than yes. than the city, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's changing now, but I, especially at that time, we're talking like the 2000s, right? Um, and so not only was it... Um, Obviously, there's people that were, you know, American for generations. Maybe their their great great grandparents had come from Italy or uh, different other Ireland. places. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, like ev even when I got to Long Island, there were people who were um, whose parents were from India, mm. but didn't feel that let's say like I should necessarily be a part of their group, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, which which is oftentimes a a thing. Unfortunately, um, so yeah, I there there were por parts of my life where I where I felt um, that, and then I spent that when I went to college too in Boston. Um, that was the first time I'd ever really left New York mm -hmm. um, and experienced like being around people from everywhere. Mm. Um, and that was a it was interesting because there were pe so if you're not from the tri-state area or Florida or Canada or like Toronto, usually you won't be familiar with Guyanese people because it's like a small country. It's, right. Yeah, and so. Um, it was so interesting to see because there's people that are just genuinely curious, which is awesome. I mean, why wouldn't you be if you don't know? Yeah. I, like everyone would ask questions, but there's people I experienced a lot of people that would be like because they couldn't wrap their head around what you were saying, they would try to tell you what it was. Hmm, you know what I mean? So, like what? Do you have an example? So, of, of like that? Pe people, people would be like, "So, are you Indian?" And I'd be like, "No." Um, I mean, that's just not a it's not an accurate statement, right? Yeah. I was like, I have, <laughs> yeah. I definitely have an ancestors from India, but it's yeah. like a long time ago. Right. You know, we've been in the Caribbean for generations. So like I identify as Caribbean. Of course. Right. And so um, people would be like, okay. And then they'd be like, well, how do you, how do you know so much about Bollywood? I'd be like, well, <laughs> we, we grew up on Bollywood. Like we love Bollywood music. Do you guys speak Hindi at home? No, we don't. Hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Well, if you watch Bollywood movies, you must be Indian. What? Uh, oh yeah. my god, that is so funny. Yeah, it was crazy. Or, hey, you're uh, eating Chinese food. You must be Chinese. It's exactly that logic. It's exactly <laughs> that logic, you know. Um, or like, yeah, well, why, well, why, why don't you guys speak Hindi? I, I don't know, bro. Like, I, I can't tell you who was the first person to stop speaking it when. How about <laughs> you don't even speak Italian? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. That's so funny. Um. Yeah. So I, I would say like. So over, people would actually say stuff like that to you. For sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 Wow. Oh yeah. Um. My, my favorite, th this is something that happened one time, but it was from a professor who asked me, he asked me if I was Indian. So I, I was like, no, I'm, I'm Guyanese. And I started, I was like, do you know what that is? I, I'll explain to you. And then he was like, are you sure? And I was like, you gotta be fucking shit to me right now. Like, <laughs> what, what, I'm, I'm, and I, I just want like, no, I'm not fucking sure, bro. I'm, 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 in, I'm you just enlightened me. I was confused my whole life, but thanks for, thanks for asking me if I was sure. I never thought about it. You're like, wait. It, Dad? <laughs> Have I been lied to? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So I, I would say, yeah, like, um, I, like, rambled to answer your question, but I've I've definitely, there's been so people I've interacted with or moments in my life where I felt like, okay, someone's just, like, not getting it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, you know, mostly growing up in New York, you, you're just around so many people that have the same experience, whether they're parents or immigrants from anywhere. You know? I think that's so funny because for me, I had that experience too of like my first real culture shock was leaving New York. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and I was eight when we moved here, so I, I wasn't born and raised here. I was raised here, but not born here. But and and that was a real shock because I didn't expect it. You know, going to a place like you said where there's people that are kind of just from there. 
you know, and where the norm isn't that that right. like you're expecting that a person is like from either another place or from multiple places, you know, a mom that's from here and a dad that's from here yeah. and this and that, you know. And yeah, I moved to Germany when I was 18 to study there. And then I always say like, it was such a trip that everybody was like German, like just German. Right, right. They were like, no, I'm German. And I'd be like, and where's your dad from? No, Germany. <laughs> and everybody has always been from Germany, you know? Like, yeah. it was weird. So I think that's like, and also this thing about like, oh, yeah, I grew up in New York. I can live anywhere. And then when you do go outside of New York, you're like, shit, I grew up in New York. I can't live anywhere. Right, you know? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing yeah. compares. It's, <laughs> so true. And yeah, it's such a weird, and, and it's so fun. To me, that story about Long Island is so funny, too, because you go like, just like you put like one foot. <laughs> outside of the you know boroughs and it's already a different country sure basically. it's a different experience you know? it is yeah. it is yeah absolutely so you started I, I read that you started to rap when you were five yeah that's insane yeah and i also you know i listened to some of your stuff but also um i you do put a lot of the Guyanese culture into your music i do like you put like Guyanese spins on songs 100 like percent. yeah that. yeah yeah um, so I guess that it, it is a big part of your identity and it seems like you also feel that you want to teach people about it and, and want to, you know, kind of like carry on the culture, right? For sure I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely like growing up with Guyanese culture, like you said, it was a big part of my identity. Um, and especially as I get older and, and I, I'm married and I'm thinking about kids in the future, you know, I, I definitely want to do what I can to make sure that culture carries on right because right. if you don't if we if like our parents were directly I was I was growing up around my parents and my grandparents directly from Guyana so all the sayings all the the language like I grew up with it but that's not how I talk naturally I'm just talking like me and you right and so if I don't make a concerted effort to mm -hmm. get that out there my kids will know nothing about it mm -hmm. you know um and, I, and my grandkids will know nothing about it mm -hmm. so um yeah just thinking about things like that is like you know, you want to make a legitimate effort to, to carry on the culture because it's so beautiful. You yeah. know, it has a terrible history of how it came to be. Um, but what it became is, I think, so beautiful, um, uh, like the cultural blend that we have. So, yeah, it's a it's definitely um, I love teaching people about it. Or when people ask, I love answering the questions. You know, um, it's interesting that you mentioned like the me starting to incorporate it into music like that. Um, TikTok really changed that game for me because it's something that I used to always love to do, but it just wasn't like there wasn't an audience. I couldn't find the audience for it. Interesting. You know what I mean? In terms of like, well, you know, I mean, it could be a whole separate podcast about social media and, and TikTok changing the game. But uh, the short version is like TikTok really made it so that like you could put something out there and the audience who likes it would find it. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? They right. made it so that it could let people decide what was dope instead. Mm -hmm. And that changed the game for me because I started putting out all the ideas I had for funny guy and these skits, you know, things about that your parents and your grandparents would do that people would relate to. <laughs> but finally, people would see it. And you know what I'm right. saying? Next thing you know, I put something up, boom, a million views tomorrow, right? And it's like, okay, that was unheard of for YouTube, for Instagram before that. I mean, unheard of for, not for uh, someone who's already a celebrity, but for a regular person, it was. Right, yeah. Yeah. And so um that really the fact that i so many people would appreciate it and uh, both guyanese and non-guyanese you know just cr and and all over the caribbean and and just people who are not familiar at all um loved it it just encouraged me to be like all right boom all the my ideas i have i'm just going to keep going and keep putting it out there because people are finding you know people are relating to it um even even things that are based in like uh this is like a shared trauma experience that we all go through right. that, that kind of a thing right people still you know you can make it funny and people relate to it yeah, yeah, and also the thing is, is that you know there are so many shared experiences in the cross cultural um, upbringing that don't have to specifically be, you know, about this one country or this one totally. culture. You know, there's yes. like so many um, things that overlap for all cultures, yeah. experiences. You know, that you can relate to. It doesn't really matter what it is specifically. So true. Like I see so many videos from from people like 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 Joanna, for example, mm -hmm. like um, you know from the Latinx community, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh yeah, that thing that you went through with your parents, same with us, bro. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I remember having that experience when I wrote my first like solo show, 
And I was like, oh man, like who's gonna relate to this? Like my mom's Romanian, my dad's German, my mom's side is Jewish. I grew up in New York, but I was eight when we moved here, so I did have enough of a Germany to like, yeah. you know what I mean? I yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. who's gonna relate to this? Nobody. But it didn't matter, you know, so many people were like, I, I'm not even an immigrant and I relate to the experience of feeling like an outsider or, you know, whatever it is, yeah. um, fish out of water, you know. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, for whatever faults this country has, what is beautiful about this country is that this is the place where that is celebrated so and true. where it is possible because in other places it really isn't as possible as it is here. Absolutely. You know? um, so when you were five, what were you rapping about? <laughs> yo, like the dumbest shit. Um, you were like, yo, I just got rid of my diaper. <laughs> uh, I, I actually have some of it still, and it's like... You do? Yeah, it's me talking about how, like, when I grow up, I want to be a millionaire to, like, help people out and, oh, okay. wow. and give and, 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 like, help go to the puppy shelter and buy all the puppies. <laughs> and, I love that. Yeah, and, uh, or, like, and, and all this stuff like that, and me talking about, it's like... It's like a little gangster thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> buy all the fucking puppies. That's right, bro. bro. Yo, when I pull up to the shelter, everybody's going home with me. <laughs> I would do that shit right now if I had the money, bro. Believe me. That's what I would spend my fucking money on. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, like, stuff like that. So the interesting thing about how I... The first time I wrote rhymes, right, it was because... So, first of all, growing up, right... I, my, because of the explicit nature of the music, my parents didn't want to hear nothing about it, right? Yeah. But I, I had young, much younger uncles and, and cousins that were like, grew up in Queens, like, you know, they were teenagers at the time during the 90s, but so they were like very entrenched in the culture, right? Mm -hmm. Knew everything about everything. And so they would put me on to like, to music, right? So at the, so at the time, all that, you remember all that Nickelodeon? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, all right. For those not familiar, it was like the kids' version of SNL. We could call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every episode <laughs> they would have, um, they would have a, a musical guest. And so on the Christmas episode, this was like '95. We're talking '94 and '95. They had Run DMC as a musical guest. Oh wow! And so I was like, oh shit, Run DMC. Like I listened to Run DMC with my uncle in his room. When I was two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, was, so they Run DMC performed Christmas and Hollis, which is my favorite Christmas wow. song. Wow. And so when they performed it. As soon as it was done, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I have to write these lyrics down. But I took a notebook out and I'm like transcribing it from memory because this is before you couldn't fucking, t you know, rewind it. You couldn't wow. find it on the Internet. Right. Or if you could, I didn't know how. Probably not, though. Yeah. Um, and Shazam so Shazam it. Right. You couldn't do any of that. Yeah. So I just opened up this notebook. I had the beat in my head and I started trying to write it down from memory. And I remembered one or two lines maybe, but not really. So I just ended up writing myself my own verse. Um, about Christmas. Do it was, you remember it, it? Do you remember any of it? It was yeah, like something about like opening presents under the tree and like hopefully all of them are for me or something like that. Oh my <laughs> god, that's so cute. Yeah, and like stocking and rocking, like basic basic <laughs> rhymes. Um, but so I was I thought it was lit because I was five. I was like this is dope. So I remember that I had this comp the composition notebook and the next day, or like close to it was I showed it to my uncle who was the one that put me onto hip hop early, the first person to show me that. And I was like, yo, I wrote this. And he read it, and then he was like, you wrote this? I was like, yeah. He was like, bro, this is what you have to do for life. Like, you're fucking sick at this. And I was like, <gasps> wow. wow, like that encouragement. really, Because I, I, I looked up to him, I mean, I still do, but for like growing up, he was a definitely a big style icon for me. And uh -huh. like, you know, the way that he carried himself was always just so cool. Um, and so the fact that he said that, I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm definitely into this. And so I kept it up. I, w I was fairly timid as a kid, so I, I really wouldn't share it with people like at school and stuff like that, especially because during elementary, I used to get like bullied so bad. It you know what I mean? So it was like not really a, not really. You got bullied for being timid and shy or? I, I think I was timid and shy because I got bullied, you know? What would you get bullied for? You know, it's crazy. So I, one of the main things, so I used to have mad long hair. Like mm -hmm. that's just how my parents left it. But kids used to always tease me and be like, oh, you look like a girl and blah, 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 blah. And it just kind of like stuck. And mm -hmm. so until this is the short, until I got to the eighth grade, like it was super bad. I mean, like I was a kid that really didn't have any friends, like sat by herself to eat lunch. People would just come by and like throw shit at me, like, <gasps> you know, that type of thing. And I wasn't really doing anything about it um, until in the eighth grade, I, I snapped. Um, and what happened was my in the eighth grade. One of my best friends was, was still my brother to this day. Um, he, he, if you saw any of the wedding videos, he's the guy that rode the motorbike while I was in the sidecar oh, to the yeah, wedding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in eighth grade, he moved here from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So he used to get bullied too, right? He had an accent. He was mm -hmm. different. He didn't know anything about American culture. So I, I, we, used, we had a class together, so I, we used to sit together at lunch after that. But 
I noticed that like he would get bullied, but he would not really he would he would fight back no matter how many people was there. And mm -hmm. I was like, he he told he was like, bro, don't let these guys fucking push you around. And especially like he was like at that time, I had been taking martial arts for so long. I've been doing it since I was, he was like, bro, you fucking know how to fight. Like, why are you letting these guys push you around? And I was like, he's fucking right. So <laughs> one day, one day I just snapped and I, I whooped a kid's ass who was, wow. who was bullying me. And um, it, it was a whole debacle. I got suspended and everything. But after that, it stopped, you know, and it kind of changed the trajectory of my life, I would say. Um, I don't know how I got into the topic of me. Oh, so. I asked you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I asked yeah. you how you got bullied. Yeah. Wow, that's, um, that's the stuff for movies. Yeah, yeah. So um, so it was actually at that same time then wow. um, that I decided that, like, I was like, I was going to sh share that I share my rhymes because mm. in the eighth eighth grade going into ninth into high school, it was a big thing. And I, I don't know if it still is, but at, at that time, and I think all New York high school was like kind of kicking freestyle ciphers on the school grounds was like mm -hmm. a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of oh, yeah. like a way to like earn your stripes. Yeah. And so people would always do that. And so my boy, Matt, he knew that I, I wrote rhymes and stuff. And so he was like, bro, like kick some rhymes in the, in the thing. People are going to think it's dope. So I did the first time I ever did it. I got so many props and everybody, people were like shocked, like, oh, I didn't know this kid could rap like that. Uh -huh. um, and so it just, that just really gave me more encouragement. So I kept doing that, you know, so at school, like freestyle battles was always a thing and, and ciphers was always a thing. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I just kept it up the first time I ever, like rec I used to, I used to record in school. I used to record shit on like my on my dad's computer. You know, like the onboard microphone. Yes. And I would just be like playing the instrumental like in the background and like recording it. And so it was like the dumbest quality ever. Like you know what I mean. <laughs> and then I then I would burn it onto a CD and like pass it around school. Wow. You know, um, and like it was what it was hype. I mean, it was stupid, but it was hype. You know, people would like my friends would think it was dope. And then the first time I actually like recorded onto our, into a real microphone in uh sophomore year of college when i just started dating my wife mm -hmm. like my now wife she she bought me um uh, my first usb microphone because wow. um, she knew i wanted one so badly and so uh she like saved up to get it for i think it was like a birthday um and that's when i started recording like professionally um, and at that time i didn't know anything about mixing and mastering i was just recording i would like put like a little the reverb and compression that i knew on it and then like put it out i would like put it on the internet put it on not YouTube at that, at that time Facebook you could like upload audio directly to like a Facebook fan page and oh, stuff wow. like stuff like that um yeah so it just kind of snowballed from there into what it is now but you did go to college I did to appease your parents or yeah 100 how did you know <laughs> how did you know because you're the child of immigrants <laughs> yeah well exactly yeah no if it if it was I'll, I'll say that I, I definitely don't regret it because when I went I met my wife there right. um, and I, I, I learned a lot and I made some some very lasting friendships too um, but at the time uh, I definitely didn't get anything education wise from it like what did you uh, broadcast uh, journalism all right so actually I'll, I'll take that back so the reason I, I chose <laughs> I, uh, which college uh, was it don't go there you don't get anything edu <laughs> educational <laughs> So um, I, I chose broadcast journalism because I thought it was just going to be the easiest degree to get. Uh -huh. I was like, this sounds easy. I was wrong. It wasn't it wasn't that. Um, <laughs> so I, probably nothing is easy. I don't know. Mm. Um, but what I did learn that actually helped me then and to this day was as part of broadcast journalism, that that's where we had classes where they taught us how to use like Final Cut Pro to mm -hmm. cut together videos. Right. But that's the only reason I know how to make my content, like to edit music videos and just the, the, the TikToks that I make right. anything. Like my editing background was all from that, and even like do, like doing voiceovers and like doing all the, all that stuff and cutting together like a cutting together content, right? Because mm -hmm. we were learning to make like pa news packages or whatever. They, right. I think they call it a package or, at that time, at least. But for t for like a news show, right? Like right. oh, I did a news piece or whatever. So if you if you would have said to your parents, mom, dad, I'm done with high school, I'm going to be a rapper now, they would have. Um, spontaneously I, I think I, I think I did kind of say that and like the reaction was not great so I was like, like, no. yeah I was like all right don't worry about it I'm just <laughs> <laughs> you know and I I, ha I knew like when I went to co I knew what my plan was right yeah I was like all right I'm just gonna bang out this degree as, as quick as I can and then because it's gonna be mad easy which it, and <laughs> and then uh and then I'm gonna um and then I'm gonna act and I'm gonna rap I'm gonna go to Hollywood and I'm gonna act and I'm gonna rap and everyone's gonna love it that was you know what I mean that was my and tunnel vision plan happened? I kind of, <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I'm still in the works of everyone's going to love it part, but so, like, <laughs> looks like it's working to me, but so you, you moved to LA right after college? Um, not right after. So, so the first, basically right up, I graduated early. So I graduated in about two and a half years. Wow. Um, cause I just wanted to get out and get after my dreams. And so, um, I got that done. I went back, uh, home 
to New York for a while to like figure it out, save money. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you do? Work? Whatever. Yeah. You have I, I was teaching karate. Teaching karate. Shit. Yeah. That's wild. Um, and so I, uh, and at that time, then I started acting school. So I went to Strasbourg mm-hmm. um, in the city. And then, so Strasbourg has two campuses, one in the NYC and one in LA. Right. So I did like the one year program. So you I paid for it yourself? Um, yeah. Wow. And then, so I, um, went to the the NYC one for one semester Mm -hmm. um, and I went then I was like all right I'm gonna go to the LA one for the second semester so that was my first time in LA that was like 2011 and so I was there for like the four or five months that that takes um, and then I was like all right it's not cost effective for me to stay out here and and when I came out to LA mind you I did not I didn't know anything about the industry. Mm-hmm. Inside, I knew everything about movies and TV just as a fan. Right. But coming there, I'm like, all right, it, I mu- there must be a place I could just go to audition for shit, right? <laughs> and they're going to think I'm dope. <laughs> like, where, where is that at? You know, and then you get there and they're like agents and managers and this. And I'm like, well, what? okay, so where do I sign up for an agent? CAA is the best agency? Dope. How do I get them to represent? You know what I mean? I didn't know anything about that. And so I learned all that, you know, while I was in L.A., talking to people, getting, a, you know, getting around um, figured it all out. So I came back to New York then for a while, a couple of years. Um, and then eventually I was like, all right, I feel like I got my, my eggs in a basket now or whatever. And you were still teaching karate here? Um, to support yourself? No, no. When I came, man, I was just doing random shit. Like what? Like, I don't even know, man. Like I was, uh, let me think of that. I love the random jobs that people have. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, I've done so many random jobs. Yeah, like I was, I was, I used to tutor. Mm-hmm. Um, I was personal training. Mm-hmm. You know that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then when I went, uh, so when I and then I was like, all right, I got my shit together, and I went back to LA. Um, and then I just started. Yeah, I got back to LA, and um, when I was there, uh, wifey was she after college, she had moved back home to NorCal, um, and then I was there, so we wanted to move in together, which was like a big. Thing, especially for her parents. And uh, where, where is she, her? Are her parents immigrants too? Yeah, from India. Okay. Right. And and so um, in like 2015 or so, I would just like I was just like fuck it, just like I was like I have enough, just like leave the crib, move in, mm-hmm. like well let's just do it, you know. Um, and so yeah, and then I we I've been, I I I would say since then I've been like fairly bi coastal because I'm I'm back in back home all the time, you know. I never really never really left New York. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you think that? Um, the immigrant, like your parents having been, Im- I, I always ask this question and I just think it's so fascinating that like, you know, this like hustle <laughs> is like passed down in some way, like totally. subconsciously a lot of times too. Like I oh, think yeah. a lot of children of immigrants like don't even realize that. Cause like a lot of people will be like, that is so scary to go to LA and like not know anybody. And like a lot of people would think that's too scary and they would never do it. And for you, you know, the way you talk about it, I'm sure you were scared too, but the way you talk about it, it's kind of like, well, yeah, I went and did that. And then it was like CAA is the best agency. Okay. So then I have to figure out how to do, how to get to those people. And there must be a place to audition. So I'm just going to go there, you know? Yeah. And I feel like that's like a very immigrant way you know, to live your life, you're like, all right, I'm here. I got to yeah. survive. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. You know, no, that's so true. I mean, I've always, I've always been super interested in like my family's history and background and their stories. I mean, I love that. So I would, I would make people tell me my, like, oh, I would, you know, I, I want to know my grandparents' story and mm-hmm. my parents' story. So hearing about their struggles and by the time I was an adult, like being fully familiar with what they went through is, was definitely inspirational because I was like, okay, at least subconsciously, I know like, this is my background. Like this is the blood in my veins mm-hmm. that these people went through hell and high water just to fucking get to America so I could have a good life, mm-hmm. right? It was about me, really. And so I'm like, all right, well, I can't I can't fail. I have to I have to not only chase my dream but achieve whatever it is so that I can I can let them say that that was all worth it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, if they you know, if if that's if that hustle is in my background, then of course I can fucking do it, you know. And then like they, obviously Chasing dreams in the entertainment industry is always going to be, it's rough. It's rougher than most, right? Especially on your mental health, right? Because there's like so much, there's rejection, there's this, there's that. But when I think about comparing it to like some of the struggles that they faced, it's like, all right, well, I'm I'm just whining, bro. You know what I mean? Well, that's an interesting thing that you're touching on because I think that's a huge thing for children of immigrants that this is like guilt. Yeah. And the like also the not really, you know, kind of feeling like dealing with your own mental health is almost like being self-indulgent or like, you know, who am I to sit here and have problems when look at this, right? Which is like, 
that's like um, a kind of a slippery slope. I get it's it is. No, there there, you know? there definitely needs to be a balance to it. Yeah, yeah, because they're, they're, and I and I think a lot of immigrant kids have this moment where they're like, oh wait, no, it's also okay. You know, as you get a little bit older, totally. And you're like, wait a minute, I definitely had it. You know, where I was like, oh, okay. It's okay to like deal with my problems and yes. you know my shortcomings and also to not have this crazy pressure on myself all the time, you know, because I think no matter how you came here, or how your parents came here, if you're the children of immigrants, you have that feeling of like they sacrificed everything. Yes. They came to a place where they didn't speak the language, didn't know anybody. It's always it's always going to be on. You know, I, I agree. And I, I have that same issue in terms of like wrestling with because every, every you have that guilt no matter what. Right. Because, yeah. yeah. And which is obviously like from your perspective, it's like it's not something that you ask somebody to do. Right. Right. So it's but and then, yeah, I, I, I agree totally. Um I think I'm it's it's like you mentioned, like I had I've had to have moments after growing up when realizing like, okay, just because your problems are not as maybe they're different problems, right. but it doesn't mean they're not problems. Yeah, that doesn't exactly. mean that they're not valid, you know, yeah. but I, I think it's a common theme in like among probably all immigrants where like they will say that, right? they'll be they'll be <laughs> they'll be like, well, like, what the fuck are you whining about because I did this or because I went through that? And it's hard to be like, oh, well, you know, because I'm like, I can't refute that you went through that. But yeah, right. but yeah, it's not, it doesn't mean that what I'm saying right now or what I'm sad about or what's upsetting me right now is any less valid. Right. You know, yeah. Or that, you know, my success is tied to um, how grateful I am or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, or that success is that, that like my happiness well, that's is a, less important than my success. That's a big one because they, um, it, immigrant parents usually have expectations of what professions you're going to do. Yeah, right. Right? Like what things you're going to be. Um, and it, you know, it comes from a good place. Like the, what they're looking for is what they're comparing to their struggles. They're looking for stability. They yeah. want you to have a good life, but right. that's what they think is the good life right. for you. They don't understand things like, well, you're not necessarily happy if you're not doing something you love. Right. That kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They don't understand that. You want to be poor. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so are they cool with it now? Yeah. Oh, no. They must be proud, right? Totally, totally, totally. Yeah. I'm. It, it definitely It took a little while to get there. I would say, to, to be honest with you, like, it, it's different for both my parents because, like, my, my dad has always been um, – He's my dad's always been the person that's like I'm not gonna tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm gonna provide guidance where you where you look for it, and I'll provide advice when you need it, and I'm always gonna support you. And like massive shout out to my dad, man. He always has supported me, like always has had my back. And so he he's never really weighed in on like you should or shouldn't do this, mm -hmm. right? Because he he hated it when people did that to him. Mm -hmm. um, and well, what did what did he do or what does he do? My dad's a lawyer. Okay. Yeah. Um, which he loves, mm -hmm. um, but wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, or if he doesn't, I, it's not it's not apparent to me. <laughs> um, but so yeah, he he never really put pressure on me in that way. I don't mm -hmm. remember ever having a conversation of like you should or shouldn't do this. My mom is way more worrisome mm -hmm. than my dad is. Like my dad trusts the process. Like he's like, right. all right, well, I'm gonna trust my kid that you'll end up where you want to end up. Um, and I'm going to do what I can to help you do that. Mm -hmm. My mom is way more worrisome, right? Which are, both of those come from love, right? Of course, yeah, absolutely. but my mom is way, wor way more worrisome. So I think it took a while for her to wrap her head around, just not in terms of like, oh, I don't think that you can succeed here uh, or I don't think you should do this, but just like, well, it's a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is based on luck because the entertainment business is not a meritocracy. It's not absolutely, like the hardest yeah. working person is going to be the most successful person, mm -hmm, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So... She took a, a, a while to wrap her head around it, um, but I think it, it, it really started. So that, that caused like a lot of arguments, you know, frequent arguments of, of like, well, what are you going to do when you're going to go back to school or do this or do that? Um, are you sure this is a good idea? Like, you know, how long are you going to keep this up? Are you going to have a family? Like that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so, but I would say after, after success, like measures of success started rolling in, um, it made her a lot more confident like, oh, okay, even though there's a lot of luck involved with this, clearly his hard work is paying off because X, Y, Z things have happened, you know, like, right. it's, especially when it's things that she can like easily, re so like, obviously not that this is like a, a big deal, but like, if I can just text her like, yo mom, The Rock reposted my rap on Instagram. <laughs> like, look at, this is his page, this is my page. And she'll it's be amazing. like, okay, yeah, I fucking know who The Rock is. <laughs> That's dope, you know what I mean? So things things like that, like it's, it's like, okay, she sees that like, 
yeah, you're you're out here, you're doing stuff. Or like, yo, mom, I like I I just got a my first role in a show. Go on Paramount Plus and you can watch it. You know, oh yeah, that's my yeah. son. He's on TV. You know, yeah. so those kind of things. Yeah. So, but I would say at least for the last like you know, probably like five six years, it's it's been fairly smooth in that in that department. Like, um, and and not only are they. Uh, they're, they're like fully fully supportive like i mean they'll be super happy to say tell people like yo this is my son he you know he does this and stuff like that especially nowadays because of because of the way things spread right people will people will say it to them and they'll be super happy yeah. right like they'll, they'll like you know especially people coming to my wedding for example like she'll have friends that came to the wedding from like that she hasn't talked to in years and, and, <laughs> and they'll be like oh i didn't know this was your son i see him, you know like 10 buick i see his videos get shared in the, my family group chat you know now she's I mean? just pissed that the rock didn't show up to the wedding right yeah yo me too <laughs> she's rocky like, son yeah. <laughs> you know you got to make the rock visit happen. Else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I love like sayings, proverbs from different countries and cultures. I always think they say a lot about the mentality of the people. I looked up a few. Did you grow? Do you have one that you grow up with um, that's Guyanese that you love that you can think of? Oh, for sure. I have a, I have a, f- a couple probably. Um, All right. I guess. Two, two that leap to mind immediately, I'll tell you, that, that come from my, my grandma, my mom's mom that, that passed away earlier this year. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, one is Gee Jackie Jacket, which is literally like give Jack his jacket. Okay. Um, and that's how Guyanese folks say like give credit where credit is due. Uh, so like, like, like she'll be talking about like my mom <laughs> being a good cook, right? She'll, like my grandma used to always rag on my mom for being like grouchy. And then so, she, so she'd be like, oh, she got a bad attitude, but she could cook though. You got Gee Jackie Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. That's great. Um, okay. I found a few that I thought were really uh, funny. So this one, I'm going to butcher it. I can't obviously uh, speak Guyanese Creole, but who does eat fire does shit cold. <laughs> <laughs> Is it who does eat fire does shit cold? Yeah, that's what it says. Who does eat fire does shit cold. Okay, I, I've never heard that one, but it, li- <laughs> it literally means like if, if you eat fire, you're going to shit cold. <laughs> I have no idea what that could possibly, because it would seem the opposite would be true. Um, I think it means like if you're gonna go and do something stupid, yeah, like you're gonna like pay the price. Pay the price. Yeah, I guess because shitting cold seems like not a good thing. Not good. Yeah, <laughs> you're like not good. I, I kind of like the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably better than if it was hot, right? I don't know. Um. Okay. So, uh, if you're Guyanese and you use that saying, way let in, us know. Way you know? In, yeah. How about this one? Okay. Fuck. I'm gonna butcher it. So, oh, no. Let's go with this one. If you. God, balls na laugh. Okay, no, I'm not doing this. You want yeah, me to read this it? One. Can yeah. you read it? This one? Okay, let's see. <laughs> if you got balls na laugh, go to my... Oh, that's a... I haven't heard this, but I can tell you what it means. If you Okay, so I'll, I'll say like, if you get balls na laugh, go to man. So go to is how Guyanese people say a hernia. A hernia. So this basically is say, like literally translates to like, if you have balls, yeah, don't laugh at someone that has a hernia. So like testicles. Yeah. Okay. Like if, yeah, meaning so obviously they have a problem with their testicles. Oh, if you have so, problematic testicles, don't laugh at a hernia. No, if you have if you have intact <laughs> testicles. Oh, okay. Don't laugh at someone that has problematic testicles. Okay. So, um, Wait, do you have hernias in testicles? I'm pretty sure no. Oh, I thought hernias were in your back. That is a form. I, I'm I'm not a medical Wait, professional. Wait, a herniated testicle? No, no, for sure, that's, for sure. That that's definitely a Guyanese thing. <laughs> that's one of your you, mari- many biodiversity species. That, <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go on record and saying because maybe this will be a real. I have grown up hearing this is what Guyanese people always say <laughs> that like if you move heavy shit and you're not careful about it, then you're gonna get gordy, which is a hernia, which is always in your balls. So. That is so funny. That's totally an urban legend yeah. to scare little children, maybe, little, little male children. So okay, maybe maybe it is, maybe it is. <laughs> I love um, that. Any medical professionals, please please weigh in here, because um, I'm <laughs> I, I, certain. Yeah. So, but this is a good one. This is basically saying that, like, you know, it's like the same thing as saying, like, if you know, if if you're well off, don't don't laugh at yeah. someone that isn't, or if yeah. you're you're having a good life, don't laugh at someone that because it could happen to you. Because it could happen to you. Move you. One heavy thing, you get your fucking herniated balls. Yeah, exactly. Right? Now your balls are not intact anymore. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <laughs> a herniated ball yeah. is so funny. 
I don't even know how that would work. But you know what? Hey, I don't have balls. I also I don't, know. I don't want to know how it would work. No, yeah. nobody wants to know how. Nobody this would wants work. to know. Okay, yeah, Guyanese people, just leave us alone with the fucking herniated yeah. balls. But drop a comment though. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. The best would be if a Guyanese doctor would comment. Yes. Yeah. 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 We need to have a part two um, where we only talk about herniated balls, <laughs> this mythical um, affliction that only happens in Guyana. <laughs> I love that herniated balls is the, that's also going to be the title of this episode. Sorry. Herniated balls. Sorry parents yeah. of 10 <laughs> 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 All right, cool. Um so unfortunately we're coming to the end of this. I, I there's so much other stuff I want to ask you about, you know, I but it is what it is. Um so it's time for the poll questionnaire. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Are you ready? Get a sip of water. Okay. Don't get no herniated balls over this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mr. Ten Buick of Queens by way of Guyana. Are you ready, I'm ready. to begin the poll question? Let's, let's get it. Do, do, do. If you were the president of the United States of America, what American food would you ban? What American food would I ban? Ban. There's so much gross American food. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's so tough to think about what like American food is. I just immediately think of just like hamburgers and hot dogs. That's true. You're right. There is probably no such thing as American food because even that gross food is probably comes from, the from Brits. elsewhere. Yeah. I, I my theory is all the nasty food here comes from British people. I'm yeah. Sorry, British people, but your food really sucks. Yeah. Um, you know what? All right. This, I just I fucking hate olives on what? E on everything. <gasps> yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, people be getting pizza and shit, and it has all, and I'm like, I don't want it. So I would just ban olives in general. Wow, you just olives and cheddar in general. Oh, olives. I thought olives no, and I cheddar. like cheddar. Yeah, no, I'm not fucking with olives though. No, not waiting. And, well, and and wifey loves olives, but I can't. No, I no. love that you think olives are American food, but you know what? All food is American food in a way. So fuck yeah. it. Greek people, Italian people, fuck you, Spanish. <laughs> get out of here. No more olives. Yeah. Although they use olives in like Central America too. No, I. You know, that's you're right. I know that it's not. An American food. I was just thinking about foods that I don't like. No, but I yeah. like it. No, but you're right. There's no such thing as an American food. Right, right, okay. right. Yeah. So you're gonna ban olives? Um, I can't talk to you anymore. <laughs> Goodbye. This is over. <laughs> uh, okay. If uh, you could add one face to Mount Rushmore, whose face would you add? I don't know why I looked at my face when I said that. Wow. I'm not trying to subliminally tell you to add my face. Whose face would I add to Mount Rushmore? Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, this is why they That's call like it the one, poll questionnaire. The one artist to ponder. Okay, <laughs> well, like it, it, it you doubt. I think I would definitely want to make it some. I know. So I guess the idea behind Ru Mount Rushmore is that it was who they consider to be the four greatest presidents, right? I guess. I mean, so, I guess there was only those four at, at the, the time. time they made the mountain. Right, right. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I would really want it to be somebody that like it really impacted, you know, American history or, or culture for 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 the for the b greater good. Um, so Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I, like Martin Luther King comes to mind, right? Yeah. Like that would be That's great. a pretty, pretty solid addition. I love it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Final answer. Final answer. Okay, great. Love it. Love it. Love it. And he's also my alumni or my fellow alumnus. If you had to come up with a catchphrase or, you know, if it's easier for you to just have like some like something that rhymes maybe it's that for the united states of america what would it be a catchphrase for the united states of america mm -hmm. man that's another great <laughs> it's a great market <laughs> question there's so many like directions we could go with. yeah that's true um it's a hard one people just like usa let's fucking go <laughs> Oh my God, I think you're the second person to say that. Really? I think somebody else said, let's fucking go. Or let's go. I like it. I okay. love it. Yeah. Let's fucking go. Okay, great. Um, okay, two more questions. If you had to, or if you could deport one American person, who would you deport? If I could deport one American person? Mm -hmm. And just to give you some context, um, no, the most popular answer has not been Donald Trump. Right, Actually, okay. it's been Michael Rappaport. <laughs> that's foul bro that's foul <laughs> no it's so weird if i could deport one american person yeah um wow 
which doesn't necessarily mean that deporting them would be a bad thing because there's a lot of nice places. But, you know, if you if you could kick out one American person, who would you be like, you know what? You got to go. Yeah. Who's I can't even keep up with names, but who's who's like a main post poster child for uh, being uh, pro-life? Ted Cruz. Boom. So call fucking it, DeSantis. Call, call it call it Ted Cruz then. Or Just, what the fuck? The judge. The judge? Oh my god. My brain is dead. Yeah. Um Ted Cruz. Yeah. I, I'm with it. Call it Ted Cruz. I would I would I would deport Ted Cruz. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where I would send him though. Yeah. Because I feel like almost every place is nice. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> like they don't deserve it. Yeah. I mean send him to somewhere that's Put him in the middle of the rainforest where he'll just get attacked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Make him the only person that ever <laughs> accessed the Guyanese rainforest. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> just get a lot of fucking mosquito bites. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess this is the last question. Um, it's all really the reason why I bring people on this podcast. So uh, I don't know. But Ten Buick, do you know by any chance how I can meet David Hasselhoff? Well, I would say if you just probably pull up to a beach okay. and feign that you are in danger, oh. I've heard that he just appears. Oh, wow. I love it. It's yeah. like, it's like, um, but you have to be really convincing. It's like saying Bloody Mary. No, Bloody Mary? Yeah. Is it Bloody Mary? Three <laughs> it, times? It is. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. I don't know how many times I did that in, in middle school. And I was like so confused by this American tradition. I was like, oh, nothing's yeah. happening. Why are you people scared? By the way, Guyanese people have crazy supernatural folklore. So, really? yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you know, I have a rock in my pocket that I am too superstitious to throw out. Is in it? one of my jacket pockets. Okay, what's if, the what's the background? No, I just I picked it up. I don't remember anymore. Oh, it's not even tied but to that, a cultural. No, I don't remember. I'm I my mom's Romanian and they have a lot of superstitions too. But I don't remember why I have it. Yeah. I just now have it. In, I've had it in this jacket pocket. It's not a small rock. It's kind of annoying. I want to get rid of it, but I'm scared to get rid of it. It's been too long. You probably should just hang on. Yeah. I know. It can become a family heirloom for you. <laughs> <laughs> My kids are like, what the fuck is this? A rock? When, That's what you're passing down? When, when, when you have, if you have grandkids, like you make sure when you pass it on, but say it ominously, be like, you must always carry this rock <laughs> yeah. in your jacket pocket and pass it on to your children. I love it. So hold on. We're going to release this episode for Thanksgiving. Um, what are you thankful for this year? Oh my God. I'm oh, sorry. Man. Well, um, being, being that I just got married, um, it was just a reminder how thankful I am for um, my whole family, uh, my lovely wife, and all my friends. Um, everyone really came. Th it, I, that was the first time I had seen everyone in one place, you know, for a long time, pandemic, and everyone's busy and stuff. Yeah. But it's just nice to see the, the love that was in that room of, of all our friends and family was amazing. Um, and I'm really thankful for that because not, not everybody has that, um, you know, I, especially – Friends wise, like when I was, you know, when I had my groomsmen, um, there were so many people that came up to me and they were like, bro, I don't even fucking talk to people from high school. Like the fact that you guys are from middle school and you still are this close. That's amazing. You know what I mean? When you guys met when you were 12 and you're 33 now and you're still this close is like a blessing. Yeah. And it, it definitely is. It definitely is a blessing. So thankful for my friends and family. It's a cliche, it. it's a cliche answer, but no, it's great. You know what? Yeah. It's like not everybody has it. And can you just um, as the final thing before we um, hear where people can find you on social media and everything, but can you teach us one like Guyanese phrase or saying or word that like an essential? Yeah, sure. Can I, can I do two? Yeah, of okay. course. So one's dirty. Okay. There's, okay. So I'll, there's two dirty ones. One, so I'll go with just Ross. Ross. Yeah. Okay. Ross is kind of like, technically, it's just like American, like ass. Uh -huh. But it's much more, um, it's much more useful because you 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 pepper it into conversation. Like okay. you don't really use it that way. You just kind of like add it into things to express emotions, all kinds of emotions. Wow. Whether you're like surprised or like if if you just gave me some crazy news, I'd be like, oh Ross. <gasps> uh, or if I was just talking about like. I was just pissed off about something. Like just now I took the train in here, right? Like, yo, the train Ross been a run late Ross and this, that, and or like, you know, something like that. <laughs> so you just kind of pepper it in. So Ross is a good one. Okay. Um, one of my favorite phrases that my, my grandmother used to always use is never see, come for see. Uh, break it down. Never see, come to see. Never see, come for see. Like, so you've never seen something and now you've come to see it. And uh -huh. it's, it's really somebody that's acting like brand new about something that's been 
common knowledge for a while. Uh-huh. Or like f- you could use it in a, like let's say it's like for, no shit Sherlock. Yeah, yeah. And you definitely would use it for something like let's say let's say you were a huge Star Wars fan, right? Yeah. And you've been a huge Star Wars fan. You've been talking about how dope it is. And I just came up to, and, to you and I was like, yo, Lucy, like you, you ever check? You should check out Star Wars. It's dope. <laughs> You're like, okay, bro. He's a real never see come for see. Never see come for see. Nice. That was perfect. You know, you got to throw it away like that too. Yeah. yeah. Never see come for see. Facts, facts. <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Tim Buick. Where can people find you on social media? Um, I'm just Tim Buick across all platforms. That's two N's. Two N's. T E double N Buick like the Skylark. Mm hmm. On everything TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, yep. and Spotify. Everything. Uh, listen to everything uh, that Ten Buick puts out. Watch everything he does. Oh, Follow him to the moon and back. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Lucy, this was, was so it was, much fun. It was my pleasure. I'm honored to be here. Thank I you. I could have talked to you for hours. So many things I still wanted to ask you. But alas, it is what it is. We only have this little time together. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. If you love this episode, please give us a little five-star rating and a review on the old iTunes. It really helps. Shout out to Douchebag Steve, our patron. Patron and Craig, another wonderful patron. I'm sorry that we don't have the rubber chicken today. You know, it's just uh, it was uh, the rubber chicken wanted to stay home. Okay, preparing for Thanksgiving. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving, everybody in the U.S. Everybody uh, everywhere else. Uh, I don't know. Just fucking uh, enjoy be happy yourselves and enjoy <laughs> yourselves. And um, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. Shout out to Gotham Podcast Studio and Suki. Uh, goodbye. If you like what you just heard, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, recommend to all your friends. And if you hated it, recommend it to your enemies. Thank you for listening to Immigrant Jam, the podcast with me, Lucy Pohl. Have a delicious and nutritious day.